Advent is a season when we wait. The darkness is thick, but in our waiting, we strain to see some form of light breaking through, breaking in. Isaiah and John both knew about waiting. Isaiah the priest was heartbroken because of the demise of his nation, bewildered. He hated the corruption. He despised the policies that ground the face of the poor into their poverty. He was livid at the militarism and the greed all around him, and he warned about where that road was going for his country. But in the midst of all of this, this gathering, gloomy, thickening darkness, Isaiah found within himself an even greater passion that gave birth to hope, a highway, a holy way, was even now being built and the exile of his people would be redeemed in a future of peace and prosperity for all. There was no outward evidence of any of that, but Isaiah hoped it into being. He became the light. John the baptizer was similar in prison. He sat waiting. The end was upon him. It wasn't going to be a happy ending. And he wondered whether or not Jesus was the Christ, whether or not Jesus was the one to build that holy way highway so that shalom might break forth throughout Israel. In prison, he was powerless. He felt like a caged bird. But even though he was in chains, thrown into a dungeon of thick darkness, John nevertheless was free in his inward world. Even in captivity, he stayed curious. He kept caring. He kept his hopes alive, if not for him, then for his people. The Bible is full of, of waiting stories. Abraham and Sarah waited for God's promise and timing. David waited to become king. Habakkuk waited for God to rescue Israel. Mary waited to find out if Joseph would marry her. Anna and Simeon had waited for years and decades just to see a sign that God would fulfill God's promises. The disciples waited in the upper room. And each of us here today have experienced forms of waiting. Maybe we're waiting for a job or a home or a raise or a lucky break. Maybe we're waiting for our marriage to find its renewal. Maybe we're waiting for our kids to pick their path in life. Maybe we're waiting for a time of happiness. Maybe we're waiting for good health or perhaps like John in prison. Maybe we're waiting for Kronos, waiting to find out if our life had meaning and purpose and blessing. All of us know what it is to wait. And waiting is hard. And there's a danger in waiting. When we wait, we often imagine the worst case scenario. We become anxious and then we become even more anxious. We worry and we brood and we get depressed over things that aren't even real, only imagined. And pretty soon, we're no longer living in our moment. We're no longer living in the present, in the real. Instead, we're living in an imagined future, a mountain that we find too scary to climb, or we get stuck perpetually reliving a past over and over and over again. Waiting is hard. It's, it's like being on 405 in the Renton S-curves. Inevitably, one is simply sitting there 
along with hundreds of others just sitting and waiting and hoping for whatever stopped the traffic way up in front of us, it will soon get started again. And it doesn't matter what time of the day or night it is, you will get stuck in the written S-curves. And that waiting can make you anxious. So you turn on the radio and you soon find there's nothing there worth listening to. So you crank on your tunes, but you've chosen those tunes to be driving tunes. And you're not driving, are you? You're just kind of stuck there waiting. And then you get mad. What right do all those people have to be on the road when you're on the road? And you get furious. And you want to honk your horn, but you, do, you don't honk your horn because it's against the law, and you can get a ticket. And then you start stewing in your car, and you honk your horn anywhere, and then you begin to worry that Dick the Bruiser, who's right next to you, thinks you're honking the horn directly at him, and he's about to get out of his car and rearrange your face. So you simply sit in your car, stewing there, and you can't even text because you take out your little text toy and you start to text and then your car gets to move an inch. <laughs> Waiting is hard. But it is also God's time to train us to become spiritual beings that transcend our limitations. Waiting puts a smack dab in the present moment, the eternal now. You're there. There is nothing you can do about it in the traffic jam. You can't go to the left. You can't go right. You can't back up. And unfortunately, you can't go forward either. It is only in the present moment that life is alive. The past with its regrets, is always a tide flowing out away from you. And the future, with its what-ifs, is always out of your control. But it is right now, in this moment, that it's possible to live. Right now in the present is the crucible where we develop our capacity to transcend our situation, to be free despite our chains, to become more than flesh and blood. When you get stuck in traffic, you can pout and rage and huff and puff all you want, but the reality is you're still stuck in traffic and it won't clear just because you think you're more important than everyone else that's also trying to get somewhere. Waiting is, or it can be, a spiritual practice that can teach you a different depth of yourself. It can teach you to pay attention to the moment, which is, after all, the only moment you have. Waiting can teach you to forgive reality for being different than what you wanted. It's why I like the breath prayer. It's why I keep bringing it up over and over and over again. Just the simple act of breathing in and breathing out. Just that simple act with nothing else even attached to it is calming. But it also focuses you on the moment. When I'm waiting in traffic, instead of road rage or frustrations, I have another option, acceptance. And with acceptance comes perspective. I'm not in control, and I want to be in control, but I'm not. And all those other people blocking my way, those inconveniences, all of whom I've turned into objects, without any story of their own. They have a right to be there. Actually, we are all in this together. And before you know it, calmly, even happily, I allow someone to slide into my lane right in front of me, instead of cutting in. And I breathe out. And I move 
because we are all in this together and we're all going to get there. Honest, that's what I do every time I drive here. I try to do that. <laughs> Waiting is hard, but it does and can teach us lessons. Acceptance, perspective, forgiveness. If we can forgive reality, the traffic jam, then maybe I can forgive the person who has slighted me. Maybe I can forgive everyone, especially those that I judge to be superior to, those who don't live up to my expectations. Maybe I can even forgive God for not being my personal genie who's always ready to fulfill my every wish. Waiting is hard, but it does allow us to step back to breathe in and to breathe out, maybe to see things from a transcendent perspective, like being in a plane and you look down at the little teeny, teeny houses with little teeny, teeny people on a teeny, teeny landscape. What really is reality? Is it, is it the teeny, teeny perspective that you get from a plane? Or is it the massively large labyrinth that you experience every day as one of those teeny, teeny specks in a landscape board? Waiting allows us the possibility to think outside of ourselves and larger than ourselves. This is what is called transcendence, and it is a gift that Advent gives for those who sit in darkness, yearning and waiting for the light to break in. John the baptizer had no hope of staying alive. He was a shrewd tactician of power. He knew the end of him was going to be death in the dungeon. He was a dead man waiting in his prison cell, but he didn't despair. His eyes could see a greater hope the fulfillment of all his hopes. Isaiah the priest, also extremely astute. He was a counselor to kings. He understood what was going on in his country. He knew it was failing. He knew it was falling. He knew his people were doomed. But he also saw a future of even greater fulfillment. The traffic jam would become a highway of clear sailing. They saw the view from the plain. Waiting gave them transcendence. But what about you? What are you waiting for? For what does your heart yearn? In the traffic jam of your own activities and anxieties and of your own fears and worries, of your own heart that gets tied into knots, for what do you hope? When you breathe in and breathe out, what do you see? What image of transcendence begins to appear? Waiting is hard, but waiting is also the time in which God is powerfully present in the moment as a sculptor chiseling on your imagination, chiseling on your heart. Advent teaches us that we do not hope in vain, nor do we hope without purpose or meaning. The darkness is thick, but there is light if you can see, if you open your eyes. If you can get up into the plane. Waiting is hard, but it's good. And in the end, seeing the traffic from a perspective of the plane, you can see a certain beauty to it all. I think it's what the mystic Julian saw when from her cell she could write, All will be well, all will be well and all manner of things 
will be well. Christmas is coming.